Today we're going to review the case of a female who came to our practice wishing to redo the bridge from 8 through 10. Her chief complaints with the existing bridge, though color-wise uh, it was quite satisfactory, were the existing black triangles around the Pontic. And her other complaint was uh, she was finding it difficult. It was always a struggle for her to clean it properly. And we offered her a couple of alternatives. We could do another bridge, obviously. We could take care of the black triangles. But equally, obviously, she'd still have the difficulty cleaning it. We also offered her the alternative of new crowns on uh, 8 and 10 and an implant for number 9, thus eliminating the difficulties of cleansing. She chose this latter alternative. One of the advantages besides improved aesthetics and ease of cleaning for the patient is another one that's not often thought about, that being that an implant restored case has a much higher longevity ratio than does a three or a four unit bridge. This is something to always be considering when offering patients alternatives because statistically we know that the implant supported tooth is gonna last longer than the three unit bridge. After our initial consultation with the patient and deciding on the treatment plan of choice, our first chore was to remove the existing metallic bridge and replace it with a nice aesthetic looking hygienic biotemp bridge. This was necessary because we planned to treat her case using guided surgery. A CT scan with the bridge in place would produce a very high rate of scatter and therefore would be unsuitable for the digital treatment planning. After the bridge was removed, it became very obvious at the saddle-shaped defect of the uh, existed in the ridge in the site of the old Pontic. Uh, we have two options for treating this. One is a conventional graft uh, placed at the time of the implant, and the second one is to simply do some bone expansion at the time of the implant. We chose the latter because this is a much kinder, less traumatic procedure for the patient. The DICOM files of the scan were uploaded and sent via secure portal to Glidewell. Once we received the DICOM files from the patient scan, along with the digital RX from Dr. Seberg, the files were converted into Simplant software. The teeth were segmented from the maxoid bone to make them easily identifiable. You can see the preps on number 8 and number 10. Virtual teeth were added to represent the crowns as well as the missing tooth. Measurements of the ridge height and width were made as seen in this cross-sectional slice in the intended implant area. The next screen shows the virtual placement of a narrow diameter implant. While there is adequate space for a smaller diameter implant, Dr. Seberg's plan includes slightly expanding the ridge with osteotomes to improve the buccal contours and to accommodate a larger implant to support the central incisor. Therefore, a wider diameter implant was virtually planned. Once Dr. Seberg reviewed and accepted the plan, two supported classic surgery guides for materialize were ordered. There is a separate surgery guide for each diameter drill. The standard set includes three surgery guides, although additional guides can be ordered as needed. In this case, the first surgery guide is the key to the case as it will be utilized to drill the initial pilot hole. The surgery guide can then be removed and the implant site preparation continued with the osteotomes. The remaining surgery guides can be used as needed during the surgical procedure. A drill report is included with the surgery guide. This report lists the length and diameter of the implant planned and most importantly, the drill depth. This depth is determined by three numbers, the length of the implant and the drill sleeve in the surge guide, as well as the prolongation area. The prolongation area represents the distance from the bottom of the sleeve to the top of the implant. So adding those three numbers is going to get, tell you uh, where you have to set your depth for your drill. The surge guides are checked on the model and then sent to the clinician with the drill port. A printable and viewable version of the plan are also available and can be downloaded online through your my, online My account. At the surgery appointment, after the patient had been lightly sedated with oral halcyon and uh, adequate local anesthetic achieved, we can see that there is more than adequate zone of attached gingiva to be found here. So the next step was to try the initial surgical guide and ensure its snug fit. The 2.0 millimeter guide drill is applied through the uh, surgical guide 
which will ensure that we go down the very center of the bone and in perfect alignment with the adjacent teeth. After the initial guide drill has been used, the next step is to remove a plug of tissue. In this case, we used a soft tissue punch over the site. If there were, in another case, a less adequate zone of attached gingiva and one wished to preserve it, then an option would be to make a small incision across the crest, the ridge, slightly spread the tissue, uh, and doing your uh, surgical drills through that incision. That would preserve uh, the attached gingiva for the restorative phase. After the pilot hole is created, the ridge expansion is initiated. This is started with the very smallest osteotome available and gently tapped into place. In some cases, the bone will be so sparse that pure hand pressure uh, will serve the purpose of spreading the bone. The decision whether to drill or to condense is often going to be made depending on the density of the bone. In this case, the bone was quite dense and using the surgical drill to thin the bone out only served to facilitate the osteotome usage. We now go to the next diameter osteotome and expand the ridge further. You'll notice that my thumb and forefinger are supporting the labial and palatal plates. Uh, it also serves the tactile purpose of being able to feel the bone actually expand as uh, it, the osteotome is advanced into the osteotomy. One of the important uh, aspects of osteotome surgery uh, to be considered is that as long as you don't remove the periosteum from the bone, the blood supply remains. So any small fractures that occur during the expansion become relatively insignificant because the blood supply still exists. Had a flap been placed and these fractures occur, then you may very well get a bone sequestrum and failure of your case. The ridge is further expanded to the 4.3 diameter using the surgical drill. And we are beginning to feel and be able to see a nice uh, re restoration of the contour over area number nine. We now progress to the 5.0 diameter drill, and we are now completed, have now completed our osteotomy. Once again, notice the nice contour where the concavity had been. We now slowly and with very slight force thread the implant into place, taking care to keep the alignment parallel uh, with the adjacent teeth. When we finish, one of the divots on the uh, implant mount should be facing to the labial. This ensures that the internal abutment connection is in the correct rotational orientation. Due to the extremely dense bone we now had due to the bone condensation, I elected to take a, an implant level impression with an open tray. This way, the implant restoration and crowns can be fabricated during the osteointegration period. We can see here the excellent impression that was achieved. It will easily facilitate the lab's fabrication of the abutment and final crown. After the impression was completed, a 3 millimeter by 6 millimeter healing abutment was threaded into the implant. The abutment is slightly oversized in diameter in order to help create the emergence profile at the initial implant placement. So often the mistake is made of using a narrow healing abutment and the tissue then collapses in around it. When it comes time to place the abutment and the crown, the operator will find the tissue is so tight that he cannot get a properly contoured abutment and crown into place. The, this use of a large healing abutment will greatly facilitate the placement of the abutment and the crown at the later appointment. The existing biotemp bridge was modified. The uh, ponic area was reduced, and this was cemented to place, and 
used for approximately three months during the healing period. It's very important to remember that even though it is only a temporary bridge, it is critical to get all the cement off so that the tissue healing progresses normally and allows a healthy emergence profile. Now at the 14 week interval, which was selected because the bone was so dense at placement, the 14 weeks was selected to accelerate the treatment phase. The bone had been extremely dense and it was uh, very obvious that osseointegration would take place very early. After removing the bridge and the healing abutment, we compared the aesthetics of a titanium abutment for tooth number nine and with that of a zirconia abutment for tooth number nine. The titanium abutment is nicely shaped and fits very well, but it's very obvious the grayness of the tissue went from the uh, abutment. This grain occurs just be merely because of the reflection of the titanium metal through the tissue. In comparison, the zirconia abutment was placed and the lack of tissue grayness was apparent. It should be noted that this patient has thick tissue phenotype. In patients with thin tissue, this would be even more critical to the case's aesthetic success. After the zirconium abutment had been selected, it was tightened to 35 newton centimeter with a torque wrench. Cotton pellet is placed over the head of the screw and the access opening sealed. The crowns were then cemented to place using a reinforced glass ionomer cement in order to take advantage of the bonding to the dentin. Uh, after applying the crowns with the cement in them, a soft balsa type wood is used for the patient to close down on. It is important with this to make sure that no protrusive forces are being exerted on the crowns as this would uh, cause the lingual portion of the crown to perhaps rotate out and not be seated completely. At this point it's well worth remembering it's very important to get all the cement removed. If the margin is deeply subgingival it would be appropriate to take a radiograph to confirm that the complete removal of the cement had occurred. After the cement is fully set, the final occlusal adjustment is made. If necessary, the labial of some of the protrusive lower incisors can also be adjusted. My preference is to use an ultra-thin articulating ribbon for my final occlusal adjustment. The ultra-thin ribbon should be held firmly by the adjacent teeth in centric occlusion. But the ribbon should slide through the implant-supported uh, crown uh, on light centric occlusion. If the patient goes into heavy occlusion, the implant-supported crown will now become hyper-occluded and resultant crestal bone loss will likely occur. So it is important your final check to make sure that your ribbon will slide through the occlusal or the lingual of your implant supported crowns when the patient is in normal centric occlusion. Here you can see the final result. Uh, the patient was extremely pleased with the result and especially with the fact that she could now easily floss in between her teeth. She also commented and noticed that she no longer had this dark shadow above her tooth which to her was a dark shadow, but to us, we know it was due to the concavity of the bone uh, above the then existent pontic. The case was accomplished using Glidewell's digital treatment planning services, as well as the zirconia abutment with an all ceramic crown to obtain excellent aesthetic results. It also demonstrated that guided surgery can be utilized in conjunction with osteotome ridge expansion.